great so in this second last class i want to talk about block diagrams we have discussed block diagrams earlier uh, i think in lecture 6 or 7 where we talked about what happens when you have system 1 and system 2 in series interconnection or we could have system one this is the parallel interconnection and then we had a feedback interconnection And in the feedback interconnection, we could have negative feedback. Or we could have a positive feedback. So these were the things we have talked about in one of our previous classes. Most of the systems that you would encounter in real world would be a combination of these three interconnections. It could be a series interconnection, it could be parallel feedback, or it could be a combination of series parallel and feedback interconnection. <clears throat> okay, so hopefully you will remember this from the earlier class. So let's think about it. The reason why we talk about signals and systems is we said that, look, we, we know that there are like lots and like very, very different kinds of systems in the world. There is vehicles, there are aircraft, there are fighter planes, there is HVAC system, there is electrical systems and so on, transformers and whatnot, substations, transformers, electric motors, factories and so on. Um, each of them have an input and they have an output and the system itself is governed by a partial differential equation, ordinary differential equation or uh, some uh, difference equation. So, there, there, so what we would like to do is understand the underlying mathematical principle so that we could analyze any of these systems, no matter what kind of system you give me, I can analyze it using some of the basic mathematical principles without necessarily worrying about whether it's an HVAC system or a motor or a RC circuit or a aircraft or a car, a vehicle. Now, of course, you know, one can imagine that even within a vehicle, let's look at the vehicle example. So we have a vehicle and it would have two inputs at a very high level. One is the brake accelerator or brake pedal, and the other one would be um, the steering. And the output would be velocity, which is basically speed and heading. Okay, so even though one can envision that a vehicle is a very simple system, which has two inputs and two outputs, speed and heading. So velocity is basically the the vector, velocity vector. So it has speed and heading. So we could uh, argue that a vehicle is a very simple system. It has two inputs and two outputs. Uh, but in fact, if you look at 
internally within the vehicle, you have a whole bunch of subsystems like engines or traction control system or wheels, air conditioning system. It may have a battery pack if you are a if you're in a hybrid vehicle or electric vehicle. It could have motor, it could have generator, and so on and so forth. So each system itself comprises of multiple subsystems, each of which also have this input output characteristics and so on. And these subsystems are essentially arranged in some fashion, which could be series parallel or feedback interconnection form or a combination of these three different interconnections. And so, so, so now let's abstract all of it. Let's just think about and let's just simplify the whole, the entire system. So we, we are given a very complicated system. We'll simplify it. Uh, the way to simplify it is we linearize it around the operating con or, uh, under the uh, around the usual operating condition, and we will come up with an LTI approximation of the original system. Those of you who will take 3551, there is an entire lecture on LTI approximation of uh, usual systems. Okay, so we'll 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 be given a system in 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 real world. We'll be given a system. It'll be highly nonlinear system, but it will be working under some operating condition. What we will do is we'll linearize that system around that operating condition. And that gives me an LTI approximation of that system. And I'm going to now use the entire LTI theory that we have developed in this class to design, let's say controllers or we'll figure out what sort of uh, noises should we reject and what sort of system uh, property should the, the overall system should, the, should uh, what kind of system property should the overall system satisfy given the step input, given the impulse input and all that. So we'll, we'll do all of that in like all of that is studied in 3551. We are not going to touch upon it in today's class, but that's the whole purpose of developing this whole theory that we have developed so far. And the most powerful of, so we have done a lot of things in this class, but the most powerful stuff that we, now know of is Laplace transform and Z transform. So Laplace transform for continuous time LTI systems and Z transform for discrete time LTI systems. So we can look at the transfer function and it doesn't matter whether the original system is unstable or stable, I don't care about it. Um, I can take the Laplace transform or I could take the Z transform of the impulse response of the system and that would be the transfer function of the overall system. Now, the question is, in all these complex systems, all these subsystems are interconnected. So what would be the overall Laplace transform of the, of the entire system? So, so that's what we want to study today. So let's look at a simple, let's look at the series interconnection. first, which is a simple, so, and, and let's consider continuous time. So I have the input X of T, I have Y1 of T coming out from the first system, goes into the second system, and I get Y of T. And these are the uh, Laplace transfer function. which is also the Laplace transform of H1 of T. And this is the transfer function of the second system, which is the Laplace transform of H2 of T. Now, what we want to find out is 
what's the Laplace transform of this interconnected system? Okay, so now this is what we are, what we have to solve. Now, here is how we would have solved it at the beginning of this uh, class. So if it was 1st of January, 2021, this is what we would do. Um, the first system is in the form of differential equation. The second system is in the form of differential equation. So what we would do is we will compute Y1 of T by solving the, okay, so if you are taking the differential equation approach, you will solve for the homogeneous solution, particular solution, put the initial conditions in, you will get the output of the system. And uh, then you will feed that in the second system, again, use all that um, particular and homogeneous solution approach to figure out what Y of T is going to look like. So for every input X of T, you will have to go through this whole process to compute what Y of T looks like. Now, at the beginning of this class, or, or assuming that you have taken 2050, um, we studied about the convolution operation. So then things are a little easier, easy because then I can take the right y1 of t as xt convolution h1 of t, and then I can take y2 of t, or not y2, the y of t would be xt convolution h1 of t convolution h2 of t okay so this is what we would do let's say after doing lecture 10 because by lecture 10 we had developed this uh, this convolution operation uh, for responses of lti system Now let's assume that one of these system is unstable or something of that sort. So you really can't take the Fourier transform. So we are again back to the square one. If one of the system is unstable, we'll have to go through the particular solution and homogeneous solution method to compute Y of T, which is very tedious. Okay, so let's say by lecture. So if system one and two are stable, and x of t is uh, has a fourier transform then by lecture 20 we can solve we can solve for y of t using the method of partial fraction Okay, so assuming that the systems are stable, the input has a nice Fourier transform, um, then you can use the methods developed until lecture 20 and use the partial fraction approach to compute YT. Okay, so it's still restrictive. It still requires a lot of things to hold true. And which creates a problem, which creates a problem. A lot of signals don't have a Fourier transform because they may be exponentially growing or systems one or system two could be unstable. And therefore the 
Fourier transform of the of the impulse output is not de not defined. Impulse response is not defined. So we can't use the Fourier transform approach. Now, after having done lecture 35, we now know the power of Laplace transform. And we know that even if the system is unstable, Laplace transform is well-defined. It's only the region of convergence that changes. So now we can just use Laplace transform to compute Y of T. So I can have Y of S equals to X of S multiplied by H1 of S and then Y of S would be XS H1S H2S. And that's because convolution is uh, convolution in time domain is multiplication in Fourier domain or multiplication in Laplace domain. Now I can use the partial fraction and inverse Laplace transform to get the value of yt. And this can be done only after lecture 35, only after we have developed the theory of Fourier transform or Laplace, uh, sorry, after we have done, done Laplace transform or Z transform. Now in this case, I don't care whether X is uh, exponentially growing or decaying. I don't care whether my H1 of T is exponentially growing or decaying. I don't care whether my H2 of T is exponentially growing or decaying. Uh, it doesn't matter to me because Laplace transforms are well-defined for such signals. Okay, does this make sense? Any questions so far? Okay, so now our goal is, so in order for me to compute the overall transfer function of the two series interconnection, uh, sorry, of the in series interconnection of two systems, all I have to do is take Ys over Xs. That's the Fourier transform of the entire series interconnection. And that's just H1 of S times H2 of S. This multiplication of the two transfer functions give you the transfer function of the series interconnection. Okay. And we do really need the whole power of Laplace transform to be able to do it for stable as well as unstable system. Otherwise we couldn't have done it. Just using Fourier transform, we couldn't have done it. But with Laplace transform, we can do it. OK. Now you can do the same thing for discrete time system. I have x n. I have h1 z. I have h2 z. I have y n and the overall transfer function y of z over x of z is given by h1 z times h2 of z. Just multiplying the two transfer function gives me the transfer function of the series interconnection of the system.
So this entire approach allows you to very easily compute the impulse response of the connected system or compute the output of this connected system for a given input just by using the usual methods of partial fraction and looking up the inverse Laplace transform table or Laplace transform table. Everything, everything becomes extremely easy and we don't particularly care if the system is unstable or not. We can do the entire analysis. Let's look at parallel interconnection. And for the same reason, if you have H1 of S H2 of S, Xt, Y of T. Then by the end of lecture 10, I know that Y of T is X of T convolution H1 of T plus x of t convolution h2 of t. But in lecture 36, which is this lecture, I have y of s equals to x of s times is given by H1 of S plus H2 of S. So adding the two transfer function gives me the transfer function for parallel interconnection. Any questions so far? By the way, the same thing will happen for the discrete time system as well. So in discrete time, yz over xz would be h1z plus h2 of z. Okay, so series and parallel were easy. Let's look at the feedback interconnection. This is by far the most important interconnection of subsystems to create an overall system that does what you expect the system to do. Um, much of the modern scientific breakthroughs have happened because of the because of having feedback interconnection, which means that you have a sensor and you use that sensor to update the control strategy in order to make sure that the output satisfies certain characteristics. So for instance, if you didn't have a temperature sensor in your home, your air conditioning system would be completely useless. Uh, because there is no feedback about what the current temperature of your house is and therefore for how long the air conditioning system has to be turned on and when do you have to turn it off. 
that entire process would be completely useless and you will never be able to have a reliable air conditioning system without having a temperature sensor in your house okay and and that's the case everywhere so you can't have a steam engine you can't have an aircraft without uh, pitot tubes and without other forms of sensors navigation sensors so that you know which way you are heading towards uh, you know once you fly over an ocean all four sides look pretty much the same so there's no way for you to guide your uh, your your aircraft uh, to appropriate destination without you know having a network of satellites guiding the aircraft that this is where you need to head towards um, so feedback interconnection is really the key uh, technology that or, or key uh, uh, what should i say configuration of system that allows us to do so many things in so many different fields and i'm going to concentrate mostly on uh, uh, series sorry mostly on negative feedback interconnection because negative feedback is what is typically used h1 of s h2 of s this is x of t this is y of t let me give this intermediate variable a name z of t and this z of t gets subtracted the z of t gets subtracted oh z is already used i need to give it a different name uh, uv w of t okay i don't think we have used w yeah we have not used w so let's give it the name w of t so that's the output of the second system can someone tell me what yt is equal to in the convolution form uh, just the time domain anyone wants to write in the chat box what is yt equal to what's the signal at this point what's the signal at this point so i have xt coming in and i have wt that gets subtracted from xt so here what i have is xt minus wt that is the signal i have and that enters the subsystem 1 or system 1 so my y of t is actually h1 of t convolution xt minus wt so that's my y of t what is w of t that is equal to h2 of t convolution y of t now if i have to compute the um the input output characteristic of this system using the differential equation approach or using this convolution approach it's far more difficult let's try to eliminate w of t because i want to know what y of t is for a given x of t so let's try to eliminate w of t so i get y of t equals to h1 convolution xt minus h2t convolution by t this means y of t plus h1 t convolution 
एच टू टी कॉन्वोल्यूशन वाई ऑफ टी एच वन टी कॉन्वोल्यूशन एक्स ऑफ टी so now i have to find a signal y of t that satisfies this equation this horrible looking expression seems very complicated okay i i am not sure how i would be able to solve for a given for a given xt and given h1t and h2 of t i'm not quite sure if i can use any of the things we have done so far to compute the value of yt however if we use now let's assume that h1 of t or h2 of t or x of t could be exponentially growing signal so fourier transform cannot be computed then i can actually do the laplace transform on both the sides and what i get is y of s plus h1 s h2 s y of s equals to h1 s x of s and this means y of s over x of s is h1 over 1 plus h1 times h2 of s this is the famous negative feedback interconnection of two systems and this is the input output characteristic of the entire system now you can use the usual partial fraction approach to compute the impulse response of this feedback interconnected system the same expression holds even in the discrete time case i have y of z over x of z is h1 of z over 1 plus h1 times h2 now let's let me tell you what the power of this uh, particular system would be let's uh, look into some example at least one example i have a system 1 over 1 uh, over s minus a that's my h1 of s and this is basically an unstable system 1 over s minus a is a transfer function of an unstable system let me put to a here and let me put a negative feedback so i have an unstable system just like an inverted pendulum or a human body or a rocket all of these are unstable systems so i have an unstable system i i am able to measure the output of the unstable system and i am going to apply 
some gain, simple gain to A to the output and use the feedback, the negative feedback interconnection to subtract that 2A multiplied by Y of T from X of T and feed that into the unstable system. Let's see what do we get for this feedback interconnection. So this is my H1 of S. And this is my H2 of S. So I know that Y of S over X of S is one H1 plus one over H1, H2. So what does that give me? One over S minus A over one plus two A times one over S minus A. What's the simplified form? One over S plus A. Perfect. Perfect. Okay, so this is one over S plus A, and this is a stable system. So I used a feedback and negative feedback interconnection to stabilize an unstable system. So I have a human body that's an unstable system. Uh, if if my if I don't have a sensor, if my body doesn't have a sensor, which as someone rightly pointed out in the previous lecture, it's an it's our inner ear, which gives us a sense of which is a basically a sensor for our uh, our body. So. If we didn't have a sensor, then this whole feedback loop would be missing and we'll just fall on the ground, okay? And so when you faint, basically one of your sensors has stopped working or at least the processing of the information from the sensor has stopped working. And that's why you just fall on the ground. And that's the unstable characteristics of our body. However, in this situation, what's happened, what ha what's happening is you have a feedback and the feedback gets amplified, subtracted from the, uh, from the signal, the external signal X of T. And based on that difference that gets fed into the body and our entire body becomes a stable system. So we are able to stand. And if someone is pushing us, we will still be able to continue uh, to, with some resistance, we'll be able to do what we are doing purely because, um, uh, because we have an entire system of sensors and actuators within our body to make sure that our system is stabilized. Uh, the same thing happens for rocket. The same thing happens for um, what is Segway. So all of these systems are inherently unstable, but, but they have uh, a very sophisticated control system to make sure that it works, I mean, it's stable. And that control system largely is a feedback interconnection of uh, the original system with some sensor reading get, getting amplified. So this is, uh, this is one way to stabilize the system. Let's talk about another way, which is what you will study in the control theory class, so EC. 3551. So in EC 3551, this is one of the most famous uh, class of controllers you will study. So this is my X of T. This is my controller. So let me call it C of S. We haven't used C, yeah, we have not. This is my H of S. And this is my Y of T. So this is the controller transfer function. And this is the system transfer function.
And the goal is of 3551 specifically, compute CS so that CH over one plus CH satisfies some properties. And 3551 is largely about continuous time systems. You do talk about discrete time, uh, discrete time control design towards the end of the class, but more or less you talk mostly about continuous time system throughout the class. And there are specifically like, there are two specific types of controllers that you will care a lot about. One is known as the PID controller. So their C of S is K1 plus K2 over S plus K3S. This is the P, I, so proportional, integrator, and the different differentiator, so PID controller. And the second one is lead lag, where C of S is K, S plus um, A over S plus B or S plus A1 over S plus P1, S plus A2 over S plus P2. So these are the two types of controllers that you will, you will try to design so that your overall feedback interconnected system satisfies some special properties. Those properties will be, uh, will be discussed in greater detail in the 3551 class. Okay, so I just wanted to give you a preview of what you're going to study in 3551. And by designing a controller, what I mean is you try to figure out what the value of K1, K2, and K3 is going to be in the context of PID controller, and the value of K, A1, B1, A2, and B2 are going to be in the context of lead lag controller. What is uh, what you would find surprising is if you open up your washing machine, dishwasher, or any of the other appliances that you may be using at home, it's quite likely that they would have a PID controller or a lead lag controller with, with very, very high probability. They won't have any sophisticated controller. They would either have a PID controller or they would have a lead lag controller so that your overall system satisfies some desirable properties. Okay, these two controllers are very, very widely found in most industrial facilities. And that's because they are extremely versatile for most uh, applications. Now, of course, there are some specific applications like aircraft. If your system was an aircraft or a rocket, uh, or a more uh, complicated system, then this PID controller or lead lag controller may not make a lot of sense. So you have to add a little bit more intelligence in the controller, but other than that for regular systems, PID or lead lag works just fine. So let's look at a PID controller for a same system one over S minus A, which is an unstable system. So let's see what happens when we have a PID controller in place. Let's say one plus five over S plus two uh, S one over S minus. Zero point five. 
So I have an unstable system and I use a regular PID controller with some arbitrary values of gains, K1, K2, K3. Let's try to compute, sorry, this is a negative feedback. So let's try to compute the, the transfer function for the overall feedback interconnection with keeping in mind that we are using Laplace transform. So it's okay if our system is unstable or if our controller seems unstable, all of that is fine because Laplace transform allows us to, uh, to compute all of this stuff without worrying about the, the fact that Fourier transforms are not defined for some of these unstable systems. So my input output characteristics, y of s over x of s is ch over one plus ch. So one plus five over s plus two s, one over s minus 0 0.5 over simple algebraic manipulation. If I had to do it through convolution route, again, it would be very difficult, but because I know the theory of Laplace transform, I just have to do simple algebraic manipulation. So let's, let's uh, do this calculation. So I have S plus five plus two S square over S minus S minus 0 0.5 times S over S square minus 0 0.5 S plus S plus 5 plus 2 S square Okay, so the denominator will get canceled with the denominator of the numerator transfer function. And I'm left with the following expression, s plus five plus two s square over three s square plus 0 0.5 s plus five. Any questions so far? Did you just multiply the numerator and denominator by S over S? Is that what you did to get to the second row? Oh, uh, so yeah, that's right. So the, you remember this S is in the denominator. Mm -hmm. So I just changed this one plus five over S plus two S to s plus five plus two s square over s and that over s is here oh okay yeah yeah and i did the same thing in the denominator as well okay thanks So now I have this feedback interconnection. Uh, again, if it was a discrete time system, I would do the same thing. Uh, 
the the overall calculation would follow very similar pattern. And now I have this as the transfer function of the overall system. So let me use G of S for the overall system. And now I want to find the impulse response of the system. I want to find what G of T looks like. So I'll have to do use the partial fraction to do that. So let me just show you very quickly what the steps of partial fraction are going to be. Um, so I have to simplify this even further because I see that the numerator polynomial and denominator polynomial have the same order. The numerator is also a second order polynomial and denominator is also a second order polynomial. So let me rewrite G of S as one, let's say three S squared plus 0 0.5 S plus five plus no minus S square plus 0 0.5 S over 3 S square plus 0 0.5 S. I think the calculation looks correct. So I get one minus S square minus 0 0.5 S over. No, did I make a, I think I made a mistake. Uh, I want to make sure that the numerator has a lower order than the denominator. So how do I do that? Oh, wait a second, sorry. I'm going to multiply it by two thirds. Can't you just- anyone remembers, anyone remembers how, how to get the, get them in proper fraction form? On the uh, bottom. Can't you factor out an S and then you can get the uh, thing on the right in terms of proper fractions? Uh, oh, uh, what, what would you add on the bottom? Uh, and then on the very right, you just take out an S. So, so what just... in the bottom, I can't take out S, right? I... No, no. Uh, so you, you, you erased your very bottom line. Uh, okay. What should I write in the numerator side? I think it should be three over two, no? Sorry, I, I forgot how to get the, this is very embarrassing. <laughs> I should know this. Uh, anyways, I guess uh, I'll, I'll try to do it. Uh, uh, I apologize, I will try to do it at home and I'll try to figure out how to get this in a proper fraction form. But anyways, I think the, the recipe is once you get it in a proper fraction form, then you use the partial fraction. So in order to do the partial fraction, you need to know the roots of the denominator. So you get the proper fraction form. Then you find out the roots of denominator. And then you use partial fraction, which I'm sure you are all aware of. And then you use inverse Laplace transform to get G of T equals to blah, blah, blah. Can we use long division? Uh, as long as you can get it in the partial fraction form, it doesn't matter what way you are using to get to this position, to, to this partial oh. fraction form. Okay, I was. So you want to use to, long division for what? Uh, to to make it improper fraction. Oh yeah, form. this part, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, you can do that. Oh yes, you are right. You have to use long division to do that. Yes, correct. Okay. Uh, 
Right, right, right. Now I remember how to do it. But anyways, time is up. So we'll probably, I'll, I'll probably give you the expression in the next class using the long division process. And then you know what the rest of the recipe is like. So, okay. yeah. So, yeah. Thanks for the hint. Uh, so I'll, I'll uh, go over this again in the next class very briefly, and then we'll do an entire review of the class. And that's it. Uh, the course will be over and then we'll We'll look forward to the final exam next week on 30th April. So will, um, yeah. will the PID thing be in our final? No, it's not. This is 3551 stuff. Yeah. So for the, the final, in, in the announcement you posted for, for quiz four, um, you, you said that the final is going to be cumulative, which is obvious, but I, I have another quick question about that because in the beginning of this lecture, when you had shown that uh, the different lectures we had learned to do the same things in or the evolution of how we learn to do the same things, if we have um, you know a, a system that we're trying to figure out, would, would we still have be required to use like the lecture 10 process if we knew from like lecture 35 no, no. the whole the whole purpose of this particular class is to go from lecture 10 to lecture 35 okay so if you are asked to do anything it will be what was discussed before lecture 35 not before lecture 10 okay yeah just wanted to make sure that i, I understood yeah, what was going on good. yeah yeah, yeah. so Thank as far as finals is concerned you will have something to do with fourier series you will have something to do with fourier transform and then you will have something to do with Laplace transform or, or Z transform, you know, so one of these three things, because that's the main meat of this entire course. You know, rest of the stuff, what we did in lecture one and two, that's all like basic preliminary stuff that was needed to be done so that we can build up on it in the subsequent classes. Does that make sense? Yep, thank you. Yeah, all right. So see you guys on Friday. I had a quick question about the homework. Um, it was, let me see. 